We're going to solve the system using Gaussian elimination. For the purposes of this video, I'm assuming that you have already practiced and understand Gaussian elimination. Let me remind you that it's the process by which we write our system with an augmented matrix. Then we use the elementary row operations to change the augmented, augmented matrix to a matrix in row echelon form. And then we use back substitution to finish solving the system. Before we get to that system that we're going to solve, let me remind you what row echelon form looks like. It requires that the first non-zero number in each row be 1, as is the case in each of these matrices. And remember that first non-zero number is called the leading entry. The leading entry in each row is to the right of the leading entry in the row immediately above it. And notice that is in the case in each of these. Even in this one, this one is to the right of this one. And if you have a row of all zeros, as we do in this case, you make sure it's in the bottom. So all of these are in row echelon form. And when you have a system in which you expect one solution, your matrix in row echelon form ends up looking like this. But let's do an example where one of these things happens. And you won't know until you start working on the system that one of these things is gonna happen. But let's, let's talk about it, let's do a problem. So we're gonna solve this system right here. So let's write our, our system as an augmented matrix. So I will have one, three, five, 20, two, three, four, 16 and one, two, three, 12. And I'll draw a line here separating the coefficients from the constants. Remember, I want a one here to begin and I already have it. So I would need zeros beneath. So let's make this become a zero here by multiplying by negative two and adding. So let's write the roadmap for somebody to follow. Negative 2 times row 1, we're going to add that row to row 2, and we're going to put it in row 2. So when we do that, and remember you can go to scratch paper to do that calculation, but I hope you've practiced enough that you're getting more comfortable doing that. So we're multiplying by negative 2 and adding. So my row 1 will be unchanged. Let's put in row 1. So when I multiply by negative two and add, I get zero. Multiply by negative two, and that's negative six, and we add, and we get negative three. Negative two times five is negative 10, plus four is negative six. Negative two times 20 is negative 40, plus 16 is negative 24. But we can create zeros in both of these rows at the same time. So let's do that. I have this row, row one and row three that I'm looking at, and notice I can just subtract them and put it in row three. So let's do that. So I'm gonna have row one minus row three, and I'm gonna put the result in row three. And certainly you could have multiplied row one by negative one and adding, it doesn't matter but I'm just gonna do row one minus row three. So one minus one gives me that zero. Three minus two is one. Five minus three is two. And 20 minus 12 is eight. So now my matrix looks like this. So my next step, I have taken care of this column. I have one and zeros beneath. I need a one right here. Now I notice there's a common factor of three or negative three, and I could just divide by negative three, but I also see that there is a one here. If I see a one that I can easily place right here by just switching the rows, that's what I usually do. Anytime I can switch rows and make things happen the way I want to, that's often my step. So I'm just gonna switch. So here's my, my elementary row operation. I'm gonna switch row two and row three. 
when I just switch two rows, I figure the chances of me making a mistake are reduced. So let's put them in. We have one, three, five, 20. And now row two, row three is becoming row two. So it's zero, one, two, eight. And this row that was in row two is going to row three. So I have zero, negative three, negative six, negative 24. So I have my one, zeros beneath. I have my one and my next step, I need a zero here. Notice if we multiply row two by, neg uh, by positive three and add it, we'll get the zero that we need here. So we're gonna multiply three times row two. We're gonna add it to row three and we're going to put the result in row three. So here we go. We have our one, three, five, 20, zero, one, two, eight, and we're multiplying by three and adding. That gives us a zero here, and it gives us a zero here, but let's take care here. Three times two is six, plus negative six. Oh, another zero. Three times eight is 24, plus negative 24, and we have a zero here. And notice now our, our matrix is in row echelon form, and we have zeros across the bottom. We do not have a row in which Z is the leading entry. So we do not have a system in which we will have one solution. In fact, we have a, a system that now could look like this. X plus three Y plus five Z equals 20. And our second equation from our second row is Y plus two Z equals eight. And our third row doesn't give us any more information about the relationships between X and Y and Z because it's essentially zero X plus zero Y plus zero Z equals zero. So here's what we have. Notice we have two equations and three variables. That means we have a dependent system and there are infinitely many solutions. But we wanna be able to give a good representation of those infinitely many solutions. So we're going to introduce a parameter. So we're going to let Z equal T. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab another piece of paper so we can do this and make it be something that we can see. So we'll let Z equal T. So there's my parameter. I'm gonna substitute T in for Z. So we have Y plus two T equals eight. So when I solve for y, I have y equals negative two t plus eight or eight minus two t. So what I know is that the ordered triple that would be the solution to this system could have a t here for the z value. It has a negative two t plus eight for the y value and I want a representation for X with respect to T. So we're coming up with a general solution for this dependent system. So we have our Z value, we have our Y value, we need our X value, and here's our relationship between X, Y's, and Z's. So let's pop in what we know. We have X plus three times negative two T plus eight plus five times Z and Z is equal to T equals 20. And let's solve this equation for X. So we have X minus six T plus 24 plus five T equals 20. Let's keep solving. And we have X minus t plus 24 equals 20. And we'll add t and subtract 24. So we get x equals t minus four. So here's our representation for x. It is t minus four. So this is our general solution for the system that we started with. Let me bring it back. Here was our system. 
So we have a relationship between the X, Y, and Zs that are solutions to the system. So let's see what I mean by the relationship. We can come up with some specific solutions to that system. This is the general solution right here. And T can be any real number. So if you wanted just a few specific solutions, some solutions that would work in that system of equations, you can let T equal any real number. I would probably stick with numbers that are easy to work with, like T equals zero, pop that in, and you would get zero minus four, negative two times zero plus eight, and zero. And if you substitute negative four, eight, zero, into any of these, or into all of these equations, you would find it would be a solution. You could take time and, and try that. I'm not going to right now, but it absolutely could be done. We could find more solutions. Substitute in t equals one, and we would have one minus four, negative two times one plus eight, and one. Substitute other numbers in. I, not, there's no restriction on these except they be real numbers. I could put in t equals 50 if I wanted to and pop it in. 50 minus 4 is 46. 50 times negative 2 plus 8, what is that? Um, negative 100 plus 8, negative 92 and 50. So this is another one of the infinite number of solutions that would work in this system. So that's how we're going to handle our system if it ends up being dependent. And let me show you again. Here's the way the system looked. Right here, let me come back in the general case. You see something that looks like this, you're expecting there to be an infinite number of solutions because it's a dependent system. You'll introduce a parameter and come up with your solutions. Let, where are our solutions? There they are. There's our general solution, and then you could come up with as many specific solutions as you needed. Let me just mention one more thing. I didn't give you an example of this, and I'm not going to, but if you had a system that looked like this, notice you would have no solution at all to the system because this, this row right here would represent 0x plus 0y plus 0z equals 1, and there's no way in which that could happen. So I just wanted to talk about those special cases when you're solving a system, in particular when you're solving a system using Gaussian elimination. So I hope you go practice some problems.